Please join me in the Christian greeting. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please stand for the call to worship. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord a new song, for God has done a marvelous thing. Our hymn of praise is, Fairest Lord Jesus, found on your insert. before God and one another. Let us pray the prayer of confession together. God of mercy, we confess that we have not been obedient sons and daughters. We have grown idle in the work of discipleship and weary in doing what is right. We have been selfish in our actions and insistent in claiming our rights. We have not honored the traditions of the apostles or imitated the example of your saints. Let us conclude our prayer of confession together. Forgive us, we pray. Show us the way of repentance. Free us from our idle ways and strengthen us to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, through whom we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ is merciful to all who turn in him and repent us. In the name of
of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Almighty God, as the scriptures are read and their word proclaimed, reveal to us the way of salvation by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may not grow weary in doing what is right. Our first scripture reading is from the Old Testament, Psalm 98. We will be reading responsibly. I'll read the odd verses and you will read the even verses. Let us read the word of the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing. With, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound, and let everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let, let the rivers clap their, their hands, and let the mountains sing together, together for joy. joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Our second reading this morning is from the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 2a. We will be reading in unison. Let us read the word of the Lord together. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them, but for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. This ends our Old Testament reading. Our New Testament reading is from the epistle to Second <coughs> Thessalonians, chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we commend you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. For you yourself know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that same among you. Some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, Never tire of doing what is good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What 
of how workers in the United States stack up vacation-wise against workers in other countries. The countries that grant the most paid vacation is Italy, where workers have an average of 42 days a year off. Wow. Yeah. Next come the French with a respectable 35, followed by Brazil with 34, Sweden with 32, and Britain with 28, and Canada with 26. Even the Japanese, who sometimes have to be coerced to take time off, get an average of 25 days. What about America? A measly 13 is average. Granted, when you add in a handful of holidays, the figure goes up. But it never catches up with the foreign counterparts. So. If you feel as if you have been working hard, you know what? You have. Of course, any of us who have been employed for a few years know that is true. Even the best job can be a grind when you have to do it every day. In our reading today, we get Paul's view of work, one that is both practical and accepting of the reality that work needs to be part of life. Apparently, there were some lazy people within the church of Thessalonica. Thessalonica. Paul sternly advised them that Christianity and laziness are not compatible. He pointed that when he and his fellow preachers were there among the Thessalonians, they refused to allow the Christian community to support them but made their own living, even while ministering to the church. In general, we have taken Paul's sternly advice that Christianity and laziness are incompatible. He pointed out that when he and his fellow preachers were there among the Thessalonians, they refused to allow the Christian community to support them, but made their own living even while ministering to the church. In general, we have taken Paul's words to heart. So much so that while Paul intended that everyone in the Christian community should do his or her share, that concept eventually degenerated into a solemn duty to work. For some people, the ethic to work inconsistent has gotten separated from its biblical origin and has become, in effect, a religion in its own right. For others, however, it became so enmeshed with Christianity that we sometimes think that anyone who does not want to work hard, work hard cannot be, very, uh, be a very good Christian. In other words, we make hard work and Christianity almost one and the same. In fact, we seldom run across a Christian today who is lazy. If today's believers have any problem related to work, it is often that they work too hard. A lot of us even feel vaguely guilty when we take time off. A perfect example is Doogie. I've been here two and a half years, and he hasn't missed a Sunday playing. Where I've had some vacation, but he is a perfect example of one who never takes off. Work can even intrude into our personal lives. There's a story about the manager of a company of 500 employees who was so enmeshed in his work that he had a hard time paying attention to his family. One night, he got into bed obviously fretting about some problem at work. After a few moments, his wife, in disgust, got out of bed. When he asked why, she said, I'm getting up. This bed is not big enough for 502 people. <laughs> there are plenty of people in the world at work who try to smirk, shirk work. But by and large, Christians are not among them. I'm not suggesting for a minute that we shouldn't work hard, 
But let's think for a few moments about the meaning of work in a Christian's life. First, hard work. First, hard work and Christianity are not the same thing. Now, that may seem obvious, but as already mentioned, we sometimes forget that. Is it possible that someone who will not work to be a Christian? Yes. Failure to work is not in and of itself a sin. But if that person is relying on others to take care of him or her needs, then there may be some selfishness involved that needs to be dealt with. We need to remember that Christianity is first and foremost a relationship between God and ourselves. The more we let the relationship affect us, the more we will behave in a way that pleases God. One result of that is that when we do agree to work for someone, we will do our best during the time we are working. Honest labor is likely to be one fruit of Christian commitment but not the cause of it. We cannot become Christians by working hard, but we may work harder because we are Christians. Second, it is possible to go too far in our commitment to our work. Can workaholics be Christians? Of course, but if they are short-charging their family or other vital responsibilities, then that needs to be dealt with when we give so much of ourselves to our work that all other relationships, including the one with God, suffers, we have some priorities mixed up. When we work hard, it appears noble. People don't usually criticize us for overwork. But do not be fooled. Overzealous commitment to work is a modern equivalent of what the Bible calls idolatry or demon possession. possession. True workaholics are under a compulsion to serve that which is not the Lord of light. We ought to be servants of God who work <coughs> who work not servants of a career. When we overwork constantly, we may say we do it to give our family a good standard of living. But our family may be losing our time and attention and other signs of affection. In some lines of work when a promotion comes, it is common for people to congratulate the rising achiever and at the same time offer condolences to the spouse. Third, when Christianity is thoroughly mixed into our being, the work that we do agree to do will be done diligently. When Paul wrote to the Colossians, he said, whatever your task, put yourselves into it as done for the Lord and not for your masters. Christians do ultimately work for God and not just for the employer who issues the paycheck. For years, Youngstown, Ohio was a major steel producing center, but in the early 1980s, Youngstown, along with Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and other towns, such as Roebling, New Jersey, became known as the Rust Belt. The U.S. steel industry had failed to modernize and was being beaten in prices by steels from foreign mill. Many people who have worked in the mills found themselves suddenly laid off with little prospect of ever being hired back. What if these suddenly unemployed workers, a man named Tony, was a committed Christian? Naturally, jobs were tight in the area, but after some hard looking Tony found another job in a small factory. He was earning half of his former wage 
And under those circumstances, some people would say, well then, I'm not going to work that hard. But Tony didn't feel that way. As a Christian, he said, I agreed to work for this company, for this wage, and I'm going to do my best. So he went at or at it. In less than six weeks, he received a 50 cent an hour raise. After six months, he was promoted over employees who had been there much longer. His employer told him he wished all their employers worked as conscientiously as Tony did. Now, obviously, Tony also had the skills that qualified him for the promotion, but his attitude reflected his faith. Whatever your job, your Christian attitude should show itself. One woman tells of a happy memory from her childhood where she used to tag along with her mother as her mom did the household chores. Her mom was a Christian and often sang while she worked. The little girl practiced particularly like the song her mother sang while bringing in the laundry from the clothesline. It wasn't until several years later, later that she realized that what her mother was singing was bringing in the sheaves, not bringing in the sheets. <laughs> the girl misunderstood the words, but she did not misunderstand her mother's attitude towards her daily tasks. Of course, no amount of faith is an inoculation against the boredom or weariness that can overtake any of us, no matter how good a job we want to do. But it helps to remember that while our life is more than our job, our job can be a place where we serve our Lord. There was a man, a baker by trade, who taught Sunday school at his church and served on a church committee. One day while riding a train, he was approached by an overzealous woman he'd never seen before who was trying to evangelize people. She asked him, what work do you do for God? He replied, I bake bread. She said, I don't mean your trade, but what service do you do for the Savior? I bake bread, he said again. She tried again. I mean, how are you seeking to glorify Christ and spread his gospel? I bake bread, he said once again. And when done in the right spirit, that's exactly right. Work is a worthwhile thing. We will not always enjoy it. We may find an honest way where we can take more time off. Nothing wrong with that, for work and faith are not the same thing. Many of us would benefit from more paid vacation. But when we do work, neither shirking our tasks nor work overworking gives glory to God. What does glorify him? is honest labor, done diligently and kept in balance with the rest of our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of response is Hope of the World, and Listen Well is played well is played through. Let us stand.
join me in our affirmation of faith by saying the Apostles' Creed together, found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. When I say, God in mercy, would you please respond, hear our prayer. Let us pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, God in mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, our salvation in whom we trust. You who are eternal, know our daily joys and sorrows, and give us grace to bring our needs before you. We pray for pastors, teachers, and all the saints who lead your church. Inspire them by your Holy Spirit, and help the churches faithful to uphold them. God, in your mercy, we pray for the elected officials and for civil servants. Stir them to heed justice and rouse the church to hold them accountable. God in mercy, we pray for those who are sick or troubled, especially the following. Tammy, Cindy, Nora Lou, Jan, Margaret, Chris, Zoe, Eric, Bobby, Garrett, Kelly, Sharon, Phil, Alan, Paula, Lord, Lou's daughter, Michelle, and son, Michael, Sarah's friend, Alex, Mary, Ryan's grandmother and cousin, Diane, Claire's husband, Paul, Lou's friends, Debbie and Teddy, Gail, Mary, Jill, Bruce and his wife, Sally, Leela's friends, Mrs. Campbell, James, and Keith, and all those who might be traveling and those who have lost loved ones. Comfort them with grace and empower your church to minister to them. God, in your mercy, we pray for all who suffer the violence of human hands or natural disasters as this current hurricane. Shield them with your holy angels and motivate your church to care for them. God, in your mercy, we pray for children and for the defenseless. Protect them with your care and strengthen your church to tend to them. God, in your mercy, we pray for all those who may live in fear of your judgment, who have known rejection, and who live on the margins of society. Show them the love that casts out fear and enables them to find a place in your church that we may be a community of reconciliation. God, in your mercy, we pray for our enemies. Empower the church to love them and to look for a day when we may live together in your reconciling love. God, in your mercy, we pray for all those who suffer for the name of Christ. Let your people in every place be ready to offer testimony to the gospel and bear persecution with the confidence in your truth. God, in your mercy, God of mercy, our strength and our might receive the prayers which we offer, trusting in your goodness. We ask in weakness according to our needs, but you give wisely according to your generous care for all the world. Therefore, we pray in gratitude and in hope through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and 
and to give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. and our gifts to God with gratitude and praise. prayer of dedication found in your bulletin. Loving God, before we give to you, you have given to us. All we offer we have received from you. We thank you for your goodness and we praise you for your bountiful works. Through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our sending to him is Jesus Paul. today is to be strong in the truth of God. Bear witness to the gospel. Persevere in the face of evil. Persist in your commitment to Christ. Live without fear. Love without reserve. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. 
And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.